So welcome. Uh, great to be here. My name is, I'm the second person here, Ali Zaidi. Paul is not me. Um, he's traveling and would love to be here with you. Um, and last year we started off a class that's really designed to um, get you to have a, an awareness of how things work in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, that's obviously a complicated thing, and that changes over time, what actually happens in Washington, D.C. Um, but the idea is to, to give you a framework uh, for thinking about um, how policy has been made um, and how folks from science disciplines in particular can, um, can be involved in that. So my, just by way of background, um, I uh, started working for uh, this little known person uh, in 2007, um, who was at the time polling in single digits uh, by the name of Barack Obama. He, uh, or as the people in New Hampshire called him, Barack Obama. Uh, and I was like, what? Uh, yeah, sure, whatever, vote for that guy. Um, but uh, started working for him and, and then spent eight years uh, working in his administration, seven years at the White House and a year at the Department of Energy. Um, and actually, my year at the Department of Energy, I worked with Arun, who I know you've heard from, uh, and Steve Chu was my boss. Uh, he is also a guest lecturer in our class. Um, and, a, and an exceptionally talented person. Um, and, and over that course of time, we really pieced together um, a very vigorous initiative um, on climate uh, and clean energy, but it was grounded in uh, scientific innovation um, and what I think of as sort of the optimism that only scientists can bring to the room. Um, and so that's, that's the inspiration for this class, and, and, and the idea is basically if, I don't know if you guys might even be too young to have seen Inception, um, which is not, a, <laughs> I, I like, I, I, I'm realizing now that I like date myself even saying, you know, movies from like five years ago. But, um, uh, but the idea here is, you know, maybe at some point in your life, you will get a phone call from the president or from uh a governor or the UN or whatever, um, and we want to have planted a seed in your brain so that you can answer that call in a sophisticated way, um, whether it's a call to just answer the question or a call to serve. Um, but then also in your life, uh, and Diane was talking about this a little bit, whether you're in the lab or you're uh, you know, in a startup or a big industrial, um, you have the awareness of how policy and economics may color your life. Um, and if you get none of that, uh, at the very least, um, we would love for you to become more sophisticated consumers of what is happening in Washington and be able to uh, think about it in a way that is um, maybe a click more uh, sophisticated than, than when you all uh, took the class. So I'm gonna run through the, run through the course uh, overview um, and, uh, but I'd love to just have a conversation with you because I, all of you will not be in the class because the class is capped, uh, <laughs> and we will not take all of you, um, uh, but you should apply for it, uh, and, and it's very simple to apply. You just have to sort of articulate why you should be in the class and, and why, what you'll take away from it, um, but hopefully we can just spend a, a little bit of time together and, and maybe I can... Um, we can share some ideas. So there's like a there's actually a teaching purpose for listening to this now just because it's a cool speech. For the eyes of the world now look into space to the moon and to the planets beyond. And we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom and peace. We have vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge and understanding. Yet the vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first 
and therefore we intend to be first. In short, our leadership in science and industry, our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men, and to become the world's leading spacefaring nation. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. For space science, like nuclear science and all technology, has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. I do not say that we should or will go unprotected against the hostile misuse of space any more than we go unprotected against the hostile use of land or sea. But I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. So this actually keeps getting better, but uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, le we're gonna leave you on a cliffhanger there. And um, so why did, why do we, why do I show you that? Uh, in part because if that speech were in 2018, there would be like, Twitter would break with memes of Lyndon Johnson like wiping the sweat <laughs> off his face. Uh, so that's, that's the most important reason. Um, but the second reason is, you know, there is incredible power in rhetoric, uh, in the capacity of a national leader to marshal the energy of uh, the American people to pour billions of dollars into something that can have transformative effects, not just for the race to the moon, but for GPS, and, and I don't need to tell you all the other things we got out of the space program. So we use that as a template uh, in the class, and, and, and what we work with you all on is crafting moonshot policies. Um, so we, in the Obama administration, we had a bunch of moonshot policies around cancer, um, and in the energy space, we had a sunshot program. Um, and what, what that was all about was, was this. It was about captivating the energy of people in industry, in academy, aligning all of that, uh, and accelerating technological progress. Now, there's a lot uh, that is not told about this speech. The fact that uh, it was the 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 technical advisors were not uh, fully uh, engaged in the process. There were a lot of surprises. It ended up costing a lot more money. Um, so one of the things we also walk you through is uh, what are the things you should be thinking about if you're designing something like this. Um, and I think the the lessons that. Um, uh, sort of are drawn from moonshots in policy, uh, frankly, are relevant to moonshots in um, the private sector as well. Um, so you similarly have to get folks aligned around a concept. You have to communicate that concept effectively, and you have to allocate resources. 
So those are the those are the sort of building blocks. Um, and 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 one of the things we you see when you look at uh, the anatomy of moonshots in public policy is that they're they're cross disciplinary. Um, so Steve Chu has this uh, he has this very funny way of <laughs> describing. Uh, science, which makes it very easy for people like me to understand. I'm a lawyer, so I'm like, ooh, cool. Uh, so I remember when I, I, I asked him, and he's probably used this analogy with a million people, but I asked him, what, explain what you got your Nobel Prize for. And he ta talks about optical molasses, which on its own does not make any sense. Um, and uh, I sort of think of moonshots as optical molasses for policy. It's this moment where you can freeze what's going on and when everything isn't moving. And by freezing it, you can actually pick out the different pieces uh, of how government works. Um, so that's, that's sort of uh, why we're, we're excited about it. And, and, and as part of the course, one of the, one of the moonshots we dig into is the solar program under the Obama administration. Another moonshot we dig into is um, uh, President Eisenhower's push around civilian nuclear, which wasn't as successful as the solar program. So it, it gives you a, a, a sense of, of how it works. In addition to the sort of moonshots discussion, I'm trying to fly through this because I'd really just love to have a conversation. Um, we talk about the sort of the bad side of, or the less exciting side of uh, policy, and that's what I call the gunshot scenario. So um, you know, you're sitting there, as I was, getting excited about Waxman Markey, which is this massive cap and trade climate change program, uh, and thinking like, you know, grand thoughts about how we're going to solve climate change. And then all of a sudden it's Earth Day and there's uh, oil gushing uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and you have to spend all of your policy energy trying to figure out um, how to build better blowout preventers and uh, how to uh, sort of recalibrate the way you approach offshore oil and gas leasing. So, you know, that's the gunshot policy scenario, and it's, it's one we will also help you uh, try to understand with folks who have expertise from the nuclear industry and the oil and gas space, um, and, and, and I think that's, that's valuable. So um, this, is the, this, is the, this is what the class actually is, what you will have to do. Um, so you'll, you'll participate in the discussions, um, and then you'll develop your own moonshot with a team. Uh, and we, you know, that's uh, one of the interesting things is, I think at Stanford, you oftentimes will, f will find opportunities to work with students in your lab. Uh, and that's then all these like material scientists like work together. And I love picking up material scientists. My co-professor is a material scientist, so, so I feel like I'm allowed to do that. Um, but, you know, all the material scientists work together in a lab. Well, uh, that's not really how you, you you don't get to be that lucky in real life. In real life, there are other people that aren't material scientists, and so um, what we force you to do actually is work with people from other. And when we're putting the class together, we really try to pick a diversity of students from different disciplines, and we force you guys together. Um, and that helps you, I think, find different dimensions in how you're approaching uh, the policy. So one of the things that I think is really fun about the class, um, but for the non-thick-skinned people in the class, I think it was a little bit of an awkward uh, uh, day in, in our class, but we had uh, President Obama's chief speechwriter um, actually workshop things that people had written. So um, you, don't write, you, you don't write like a whole 15-minute speech about Rice playing Texas, but you do describe your policy. And we had everyone write down, so every group wrote down their policy. And then we had Cody Keenan, who is the president's, uh, last president's chief speechwriter, literally go through everyone and provide feedback. And he didn't know which group was which. Uh, but you could, <laughs> when he was talking, you could tell which group was which, because he was very candid. Um, <laughs> and you guys, are, you guys are really good at a lot of things, but like communicating with everyone in America is not, not, always, your, uh, not always your thing. So, so here's the nuts and bolts. Uh, I think that the top two bullets are probably the most important two bullets on the slide. You probably think the last three bullets are the most important. So the top two bullets, this is not about uh, you becoming me <laughs> or becoming a policy person. Um, this is about you becoming uh, policy literate uh, so that 
Uh, so you don't get hoodwinked when policy people say, oh, well, this isn't possible because da 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 Well, no. Uh, you know enough to be able to know that that's probably not true. Um, but so that's, I think that's sort of, that's the ambition. Uh, it is a modest ambition. Uh, and, then, and then this is relevant. So um, uh, the course is graded on you showing up, you being engaged, um, and uh, the written work product. And then you, you actually have to present your um, moonshot to folks who have been in government, um, both folks with technical backgrounds uh, from sort of science math perspective, but then also people who have pure policy background and they couldn't care less about <laughs> your, 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 t your technical side. And they're focused more on, does it make sense for the government to be in this business at all? Um, is this politically viable? Are you communicating it in a way that, that would be interesting at all? And so the, the end objective is, can we put together a policy that when I was working in the White House and we were, you know, running our process on State of the Union, is your policy the policy we would put into the State of the Union or not? And, uh, uh, and I think it's a, it's a pretty, I think it's pretty, it's pretty fun. Um, so I'll leave it at that and, I, and, and open it up to questions on the class, questions about meaning of life, direction of Washington, whatever you, whatever you want to talk about. And, and if you don't want to do that now, I'll be around for a little bit before I head back to the climate summit. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's very brief. Can you tell us a fun story from your time? <laughs> <laughs> we just want to know what it is working with the law. Yeah. <laughs> so he's great. I, I was just having this conversation. He's um, he it, had sort of a remarkable poker face in meetings, which actually is really it's. Uh, it's a t it's <laughs> it makes it really hard as a staffer because you know your your natural instinct uh, is you sort of read the face of the person you're trying to impress and if they're impressed you just keep going and if they're not impressed you stop and you like change gears but when they're when they have a complete poker face uh, you actually just have to say what you think is the best thing and then you move on um, so there was a there was a lot of that. Uh, I, I, one of the things I thought was very interesting about the president was um, a tremendous capacity to, to listen to someone sort of yammer on about their topic for 15 minutes and then pick out the thing that was, was sort of like the nub of the issue. Um, so I remember having a long discussion about fracking and methane and, uh, you know, uh, well casings and so on and so forth and he and he he after people had talked for like 15 minutes he says okay so you can't tell me that we've done everything we can do to make sure that the kids water is going to be clean and, and we were like yeah I guess that is what we're <laughs> that is what we're telling you um, so it was it, you know the the ability to sort of synthesize and bottom line it and I you know one of the things and I I I love working for Barack Obama. I also really loved working for Joe Biden. Um, and one of the things he would say, I remember sitting around his like dinner table at his house, and he we were talking about some esoteric tax policy, and he said something. He said, "You know, you all are very fortunate to be able to have like paragraph long discussions about policy, but everyone else is like really busy living their life." Uh, and so I need a way to communicate this that is actually going to like carry. Um, and it's not because people are dumb, but it's because people like actually don't have the, uh, the luxury of being able to, to do this. Well, the good thing is you all have the luxury of taking this class and <laughs> writing paragraphs about policy. Um, but, but one of the things we do try to get you to do is, is think about how, how, does, how, does, how does a press narrative form, how do, how do people start thinking either solar is a good idea or coal needs to get bailed out. How do these things get cemented in the psyche? Um, and this year, what we're going to try to do is actually get folks to focus on one set of challenges around transportation um, and think about, are there ways for us to use AI and AS to accelerate the transition uh, to low carbon? Um, and maybe that's part of our, our strategy. 
Um, now when it comes to, I'm just trying to imagine here, when it comes to such high level discussions of thought and meetings, right? Then how do you go about the detailed technicalities which you sometimes need to make to Stanford. <laughs> Stanford does it. Um, so this is a great, that's a great question, right? So John F. Kennedy gets up and says, we're going to go to the moon. Drops the mic and he's like, gone. Who's going to go to the moon? Like, <laughs> where, where is that happening, you know? Um, so uh, that, so that's, that is a key thing. And, and one of the things we talk about actually is policy implementation, failure of policy implementation. Um, so there's a really strong tendency, I think, uh, at the presidential level to make these like broad declarative statements. Um, and it's bad if after that you're trying to figure out implementation. So the, the right way to do it is you work with your departments, you work with your national labs, you consult your uh, folks in academia, you consult the folks in industry, and when you go to the president, you say, here's the one sentence is going in your speech, which is like, let's make solar the same price as fossil fuels. There's like a whole massive apparatus sitting underneath that that's just ready to rock. Um, so. But, but you know, that's not the glamorous part. Uh, if you watch Veep or West Wing or, I don't even know, like, Designated Survivor or whatever, uh, uh, they don't talk about in policy implementation on those shows because it's not the glamorous stuff. But I think that's where things go really bad. I was just going to ask, um, in terms of policy literacy, do you have any kind of, like, cheat sheet for policy translations that you could run through quickly just in terms of like because we hear things on the news all the time and it's like if we're not actually paying attention to it and um, just kind of things to kind of try to help us hear a little more clearly yeah i mean i think the first thing that i ask people to do is if a member of congress is speaking or a senator is speaking figure out where they're from um so you know chuck grassley awesome guy He's from Iowa. He's Republican. Uh, not every Republican is massively gung-ho for the tax credit that supports wind, but Chuck Grassley is massively gung-ho. Now, you could read a news story that says Republicans are gung-ho for the wind tax credit and then quotes Chuck Grassley, and you could think, oh, cool, like, this is totally bipartisan, everything is great, and, like, I'm going to go build a bunch of wind, I'm going to do a PhD in this because this is, like, a totally politically durable space. Well, it turns out, like, no, because, because Chuck Grassley's state produces, like, 40% wind, and he's, like, a complete anomaly. So I think the, the first thing to do is just, like, Google where the member is from. Um, the second thing that I, that, that, and I'll just leave it at two, because I want you to come to the class for the third one, uh, is, is if you read any newspaper from Washington, D.C., be very careful of the storyline that says such such and such person said this and such and such person violently disagreed with them and and like cuz there is literally nothing washington papers like to do more than to create like a he said she said so on so and so was up yesterday but now they're down um the sort of like binary uh, binary dynamic is a is a massively popular dynamic, and I'm just picking on the White House and Washington press corps. That's probably true more broadly, but they just love to show you that the the fluctuation, and it's I think it's very unfair. Uh, it's like going out and sort of measuring tide in the morning and at night, and just writing about that, and then like, <laughs> what do you know? You know nothing. <laughs> Right? Um, so it's like yesterday climate change was like leading to high sea level because we measure in the morning. And today it's really low. You know, like that's a very, so, uh, so double, cl <laughs> d d double click for like the, the line of best fit uh, when, you're, when you're reading the press. More? What's your favorite and least favorite policy from the current administration? No, oh, goodness. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are being yes. That's a good reminder. Um, so look, I I have actually been really surprised at how uh, some things have been durable um, through through the transition. One thing that I was uh, obsessed with uh, uh, in the second term was water innovation. 
So, you know, we, we had done this remarkable thing with clean energy and with water, no one really spent a concerted breath thinking about how do we translate that into water. And we actually got the same band together that had done Sunshot and we created um, a, a similar effort around renewable desal. And this administration has continued funding it. They've scaled it up. They are like funding the entire water innovation strategy we put together. Um, so that's, that's uh, for me, one of my favorite things because honestly, water is the medium through which we feel climate change. And if we can come up with something that helps us create essentially new water, that's gonna help uh, whether we're in three degree world or two degree world or four degree world or five degree world. Um, I don't know if it's world still, but then, uh, um, so that's, I think that's my favorite. Um, you know, the thing that, that gives me the most anxiety about the current administration is less a specific policy. I think it's more the tethering to hard science um, and a fact basis and record in making policy. Um, I think that's the one of the things the government does, the U.S. government does best. Um, you know, in, in law school, you learn a lot about the words arbitrary and capricious. Uh, and the U.S. government is not a banana republic, so we don't do things that are arbitrary and capricious. Um, but the opposite of arbitrary and capricious is like sound and technical. Uh, it is tethered to the science. And so, um, you know, that's a thing that I think has, has gotten a little bit of stress, um, especially on the environmental policy side, and that, that's, that gives me a little bit of heartburn. One more? Our pizza's like, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you guys. Um, good luck. Have fun. <laughs>